Without any further ado, um, I'd like to welcome um, Dave Porter, G4OYX. Thank you for uh, waiting for all the uh, waffle. <laughs> and um, he's got a very intriguingly named talk for us tonight, which is called HF and No PTT. So um, with that, with a very warm Radok uh, welcome, both from the floor here and virtually, um, welcome to Radok, and uh, I'll hand over to you with a round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Dave. Yes, good evening, all. Can you hear me, Mother? Yeah, Hello, clear. can you yes. hear me? Can yes. you see me? Yes, we can. Good go. Do you want to, when do you want, let me know when you want to, who's, who's running the, the logic on this? Is it you, Tom? Uh, largely yourself. Uh, have you got a presentation to show? I've got it. Yeah, I've got the presentation ready, and Just I can do... I can share screen when you tell me to. Yep, uh, at your leisure, please. Okay, well, I'll just do a quick intro about myself, and then I'll um I'll I'll go on the screen share. Yeah, my call sign is G four O Y X. I was a G eight G eight X Y J. Uh, my son's got that now, so he's got an older call sign than his father, which is quite bizarre. He works at. Uh, the Wooferton transmitting station. He's got a, he's finally got in there, HI. <laughs> so he's a transmitter engineer and they've been rather busy today, as you'd expect, with uh, some certain extra transmissions for both the BBC and I gather the Voice of America and uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. Okay, my career, well, I kicked off in the BBC in 1970, started at Wood Norton on a technical assistant course. And just for local interest with you guys, there was a guy on the course called Ros Kneebone who came from Kent, but he ended up, he was a, un, unlike a transmitter people that we were, he was a receiver man and was sent to Tatsfield. But when they shut that monitoring station about 1975 or six, it was moved to Caversham, just down the road from you. And of course he ended up in Crowsley Park for his sins for a good few years. So that's, uh, that's Ross Kneebone. So we all started off there. Then we went off to various transmitter stations for more training and more work. I ended up at Daventry um, on the HF there for a couple of years. Then the BBC decided to have all engineer shifts and not have young persons running around. So we all scurried off and looked for other jobs. I managed to find a post at Droitwich in Worcestershire as a technical assistant. Uh, there were three on, on the shift there. So I was at Droitwich for a couple of years. and. Um, and then I left Droitwich and went to, again back to Wood Norton on a, a C course to become a C engineer. That was a classic old grading net term, a C engineer, as in the, the letter C. Um, and I was sent after passing the course. It was an interesting, it wasn't quite such an interesting course as the first one. That, that A course I went on in 1970, if you failed, uh, you got the sack. The corporation were quite uh, <laughs> um, mercenary. But it wasn't so bad. Once you got in, you're OK. Anyway, so I went on the C course and passed and they, I just got a note saying, yes, thank you for that. You'll leave Droitwich and you'll go to Washford in Somerset. So I worked there for six months and like an idiot, I saw an advert for staff required in TV transmitters. So I did go to ventured into TV, but it was a horrendous time to go because they were sending folks everywhere around the UK on sort of one month contracts or just over a month. So they didn't have to pay you any money but there was nothing permanent about it. And after about a year of this, it was rather grinding. And I rang up personnel department and said, for crying out loud, can you get me out of this? And they said, yeah, if you could do four months at Wester Glen in Scotland, we'll give you a permanent base at Daventry. So I says, yeah, thank you very much. So off I went to Daventry for a second time. When I walked through the door there, the station clerk, it was a Liverpudlian says, Ech, You've been here before. I says, yes, Mr. Eels. He says, um, hang around today, he says, on day shift, and you're on nights tomorrow. I thought, oh, thank you, Frank, for that. <laughs> they uh, just assumed that you still remembered it all. So I did Daventry, married the station cook, um, ran away to Brookman's Park after I got promoted in uh, Hertfordshire. That's the, the station, MF station that serves London. And we stayed there for four years. And in the middle of that was the 1978 wavelength changes. So I learned a hell of a lot at Brookman's Park because uh, you only have wave changes on the medium wave about every 40 years. It's not like on short wave with every hour or two. And um, 
the problem with the 1978 changes were that we took all the old kit out and installed new and the new stuff was automatic so we'd actually did all ourselves out of a job and uh, a job came up at Wolferton in Shropshire which was the voice of America relay station in the United Kingdom transmitters operated by BBC on all the official documents so I went to uh, Wolferton and uh, as a transmitter engineer and then very soon I got promoted to senior transmitter engineer at Wolf and I stayed there for the rest of my career so that was about another 30 years at Wolferton um, and in the mean during that we were privatized in 1997 the BBC wanted to get rid of us um, it was that or adverts on radio 2 so they got rid of us and got the money from a, a management employee buyout called Merlin Communications. They looked after the shortwave and the overseas stations and the Bush House control room and the scheduling unit for the shortwave. And the domestic stuff went to a company called Crown Castle, who were then later taken over by National Grid Wireless, who then sold it off to uh, Arkiva, which is what it is now, which was the old uh, IBA NTL line so it's all become one operation on the domestic but uh, Merlin sold out after five years uh, to Vosper Thornycroft and that became BT Communications and then Vosper Thornycroft was taken over by Babcock and that was when I left in uh, 2012 but um, since then Babcock sold out he's got out of communications and sold out to Encompass Digital Media an American company and there's ever more satellite dishes at Wolferton transmitting station. So uh, M Compass look after Wolf, but they don't look after uh, Skelton, which is now an MO, it's almost like a defense site now, runs the uh, VLF services. But that's still owned by, by Babcock. So that's the way that works. I did have a, a little foot in the water for a couple of three years and ran, and ran Wolferton. Uh, and also, if you run Wolferton, you get Orford Nest to run as well. So I've had another million watts there with two 500 kilowatt services, as well as a, a good dose of uh, six by 250 kilowatt transmitters at Wolferton and four by 300s in my career, plus some later ones from RIS. So this, um, this talk was partly kicked off by, you, with the line, loss of 200 and 49,750 watts. So if we go to the slides, you can see what we've been up to with not requiring a PTT. So I'll just try and share the screen. Can somebody just interrupt and tell me if you can see that on the screen, please? Uh, not as yet, Dave. Oh dear, well, I've got it, but I don't know how to give it to you. I'll just try it again on that one. Yeah, that's coming to life there with us. Yeah, we can see uh, your main slide application. On the, on the air with HF. So if I go to slideshow, <laughs> and I'll start from the first one, if it lets me do it. Now can you see it? That's perfect, Dave. Thank you. That's good. Okay. Right. Well, welcome to On the Air with no H on the, on the air on HF with no PTT or receiver. Okay. This is what we uh, ended up doing to get on the air. <laughs> Not me, but for other people. Since um, the late 90s, well, the sort of late 80s, or just, just over into the 90s, when special event radio was authorised by Ofcom or its predecessor, the Radio Authority, or before that, something else, um, they allowed certain stations, if you gave them enough money, to come on the air on medium wave for a special event for 28 days or 28 times a year. And you normally ended up with some sort of transmitter. And I've been building uh, broadcast transmitters for this market for quite a while. Uh, but there's been some changes in Europe um, following the, the big broadcast stations leaving shortwave. Quite a lot of enthusiasts have wanted to get on the air in Europe. And I think the Germans were the first one to think, well, we've got a licensing authority if we... Uh, if we just put a price on it, they'll, the lads will pay and they'll want to be on the air. And they're called Bnetzer in, um, um, in Germany. And they look after comms 
uh, water and electricity apparently as well. It's a sort of like a big big boys Ofcom, but it's the Beanetzer and they uh, organized it that stations could apply for licenses. And if you gave them enough um, euros, you'd get one. And I've got a couple of mates in Germany who've been uh, wanting to do this for years. And they said to me, can you, uh, I think they'd have the go at building their own transmitter and not using a Roden Schwartz one and not having very good results. So they said, have you got a design we can have, Dave? I said, well, yeah, actually, I've got the medium wave design and uh, I can alter it to short wave for you. And this is what we've been doing. This is the sort of refinement of, of the designs, really. Um, so we, what we've got here is like a 250 watt standard chassis. Uh, you can run it for AM on all the bands from 531 kilohertz if you want, up to about, it's quite happy to go as fast as nine megahertz without uh, too many structural changes, apart from the inductors, of course. So what we're looking at here is a 250 watt transmitter. It's got a frequency synthesizer in the die cast box at the left. Um, I think well, hopefully you can see uh, the, the, the mouse point to move in. So there's the frequency synthesizer there. That's a, a kit from uh, GW4GTE, Dave in the Erexum, S9plus.com. Uh, he uses Eric who writes for Practical Wireless, gw 8 LJJ as a kit supplier and um, that's incorporated that kit into a into a die cast box it needs 12 volts it extracts that from the front of the transmitter and it's got a BNC output that goes into the words synth in on the front um, so on the transmitter you've got a grid current meter up the left on the top here grid current 20 milliamps and cathode current 500 milliamps. The standard sort of um, tuning controls for simple transmitters, it is valved, uh, PA tune, PA load, and then the control works down the bottom here. So the AUX switch, a delay to let the heaters warm up before you can get any HT on, then you can, you can switch the HT on and you can, um, go from reduced or full power or if you leave it in full power it will automatically come upon reduced and then switch to full after about three quarters of a second uh, the only other indication on the front is drive interlock you really do need to know that you've got this synthesizer unit connected into there and that the the driver tube is giving enough power to the final stage the reason for that is you do not want to apply modulation to a modulation transformer, and we'll look at that in a second, uh, without a load connector. You do want a proper load on the end, so you want a set of PA tubes that have got grid current and are actually delivering something. So we've got a drive interlock. If that's not made, it will not let audio power at 200 watts from a big boy's disco amplifier find its way onto the mod transformer. I'll go to the next slide. I might that one. Here it is. So this is a three-quarter view, uh, a rear three-quarter view of the transmitter. Um, you're looking at 250 watts out, so you want about 350 watts DC to the three tubes here, which are the output to trio in parallel. They're Russian tubes, GU50s, not to be confused amongst the old timers who think that GU50s are. Uh, rectifiers from uh, Mullard. But no, these are uh, GU 50s from Russia, and there are clones of, an Amer of a, a German Nazi design, the LS 50 Telefunken tube. And um, they, they seem to have done very well with those tubes since the Second World War and made thousands, well, if not probably not, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of them. I'm surprised there's a million of these. An unusual base, uh, eight pins. Uh, but we'll look at that in a little while. So, yes, 300 odd watts. So there's the main HT transformer. And that's all it's got on it, just an HT winding with a tap. Uh, and the modulation transformers here. I have these wound by a guy in uh, near Malvern who used to work for Scott Transformers, and he does them in his retirement, Tony Waller. He's not licensed, but he is king of the windings. Uh, so you've got a main transformer here, an audio transformer here. There's a secondary winding at 2,800 ohms. I said, why is it 2,800 ohms, Tony? He says, because I can't get any more turns on. So it was fair enough. And um, the primary, the, the, the input winding is, is six ohms at high power. 
mains in the back, a bit of fusing down here, and a, a loudspeaker type connector for the input audio from the disco amp. Dead easy to get those these days. Happy to give about two or three or 400 watts into, into four ohms. So um, a good choice, just use a disco amp and then that's that bit sorted. I always get the people who use these to buy the amplifier themselves because then it, when it blows up, because it's solid state, it always seems to be the case. Um, they can then refer it to the person they bought it from rather than me trying to do it as a third person. Uh, tubes, we've got um, PL84. And to those who remember uh, tubes, you know, it's, a, it's the brother almost of the EL84, but it doesn't have quite the same characteristic. PL84 is a 15 volt heater and um, it's got its characteristics alike EL86. So it's a lower impedance device, but it works great as a, as a driver stage for these three tubes here. These are 12 volt heaters, 0.75 of an amp, not critical each. The other two tubes, keep it simple, David, are PLH4s. Again, these are clamp tubes. And in the event of drive failing here into this from this stage into the final stage, there's no drive here and drives not detected. The clamps will conduct and drop the screen bolts on these tubes to a very low level. I've got the circuits of this in a bit. We'll have a little explore of those later. So you've got the back of the meters here. There's a PA tune capacitor, nice wide space veins. Don't want the spiders getting fried and the flashovers. And, and a PA load capacitor of 500 plus 500 picofarads. Jay Burkitt's thousand puff blocker. And one of the most expensive items on the transmitter is a, an RF choke from the States, 1.1 millihenry at half an amp. And, um, they seem to just keep coming out of the States. Not a, they're not a problem to buy. They're expensive, nearly 50 quid, but you only hope to have to buy one. Um, unusual for RFE type valves, there's no top cap. The, the, the actual anode connection is underneath and we'll look at that in a minute. Uh, a couple of block resistors here, uh, both at 10K, both in series to give a 20K dropper. That's for the screen bolts for the final tubes. And a, a low impedance smoothing choke there, about which we will see more later. Okay, here's the, uh, the under part of the under view. The striking thing is there is a bit of solid state, well, two bits of solid state in this actually. The, um, there's a board on the right hand side that you can't see that's a 555 timer that works a 40 second delay between the heaters coming on and the chance to get HT on. And uh, there's also, as my mate in, in uh, Cradley Heath calls it, it's a waffle amp, <laughs> uh, WA1FFL uh, retails these as a kit. It takes the um, 500 millivolts out the synthesizer and jacks it up to about 10 volts peak to peak into a high impedance that feeds the, um, the PenRF driver stage. So there's the tuning for the uh, PenRF. Oh, the, they're easy to work, these transmitters, in that if, you, if they're for this HF market, they're allowed A frequency by B Netzer or by now the Dutch or by now the Danish. So you can set it up on literally on their frequency. They don't need to have it wave changeable. So that makes life easier. Um, EHT, the HT rectifier is here, 12 diodes, BY255s, and there's some relays here. Uh, the first one is the delay one. The second one's the power. And the third one is the audio is suppressed unless we have grid current relay. So they're 12 volt at uh, 10 amp relays on that one. Filament transformers are here, uh, 15 volt, 25 BA, 12 volt, 50 BA to light the tubes up. You can't see the PA tubes at the moment on this shot. Um, right. Next slide. Okay, here's a sort of slightly far away shot of the PA and what's underneath the chassis. You can see the three um, GU50 tubes here. Um, slightly unusual base. It was picked by the Russians uh, and they would use specialist bases to mill spec. And they had a locating mechanism in them that you couldn't put the valve in 180 degrees out of phase. These, uh, we've run out, we've used all those. 
<laughs> the military have run out of, the, of, of letting those ba bases go. So we've had to buy them now from China. It's called a B-8B or some strange name it's got anyway, uh, base. And you do have to be careful when you insert the tubes that you put them the right way round. Um, I've got a close up of those, so we'll look at that in a bit. There's a bit more of the PA stage. There's the relays again. Uh, three HD smoothing capacitors in series here. Notice the insulation underneath and the strange bits of green wiring we will go into in a minute. The Pen RF stage runs from the main HT at about 800 volts. So it always dropped down to 250 by a, a 10, a 20, a 20, a 20, and a 20 in series parallel to give 20K. So that's the, the sort of hot area of the chassis. Those big green resistors on the other, are on the other side of that hole on the top of the chassis. This is a view from underneath. There's an RF choke in the, in the drive here, but let's go to the next shot and you'll see a, a close up. Oops, that's the wrong one. Let's use that one. Here we are. Okay, so this is the interwiring from, um, from underneath. You can see the three antiparasitic stoppers on the anodes. And you'll notice that they're, um, they're all they're connected together at the top, of course, to go through a feed through insulator. But you'll see here that there's a, an earth tag and then the outer of RG174 coax that wends its way through all these things. And it's not, it's only soldered just on the pins. It's quite flexible. The reason for this is that these, these valve holders from China, um, you must, if you're gonna use them, they are, they're, they're okay, but you must always, when you actually attach all the components to them, you must have all the valves in permission, in, in position to uh, orient the pins correctly because uh, they seem to want a bit of leeway. And that's why I haven't put a rigid wire all the way through here to connect a chassis at both ends and in the middles, just give it a bit of flexible so you can uh, jiggle the tubes into place. The actual uh, connections are anode then, uh, which is pin six. Or is it seven? And it doesn't matter anyway. Um, filaments are here, 12 volts. The other end of the filaments are earthed from that one. This is the screen grid in, in, in um, pink. Control grid is diametrically opposite the anode, well screened in the tube. And notice both screens in the tube are what come out to the bottom and are earthed as well. So they've really gone to town in the design to keep the capacity of the anode away from the grid. Um, the other connection here is the cathodes, uh, which are bypassed by point ones, and uh, that's the actual close-up of the of the RF stage. You've got the the RF choke here, which we'll look at on the circuit diagram in a second, and the grid bias resistor. It's auto bias, hence the need for um, the clamp tubes. There's no actual protective bias on here. This is a close-up shot of the um, of the PA coil classic British coil uh, former, and uh, I just use um, 18 or 16 gauge copper wire and some long 6BA tags from Mr. Burkitt, which I solder on. And then the users can alter the tap if they wish by just uh, popping a nut and bolt into whichever of these tappings they need. That one's always the same, of course. Uh, coming up from the PA. There's the blocker capacitor from Mr. Burkett, 1,000 puff, 10 kV, and the top of the choke from, uh, from the States. So that's the uh, close-up of the PA section. There's the um, HD rectifier, BY255s, uh, 1.3 kV each at about two amps. So quite well, three amps, quite vicious devices. So best to parallel, best to series them up to get even more voltage on the bridge rectifier. Um, there's another one of these tag blocks underneath here to which the distribution is. You've got the AC distribution there from the, from the connections as they come in uh, and, and switch through. So the three relays then, we looked at the, the delay one there. We'll look at that on the circuit in a minute. Here's the, um, the power uh, reduced or full. So it's about hundred watts out in reduced, 250 watts out in full and the audio suppress. There's a pilot relay here for the LEDs on the front, that one there, and a little two, that, no, that's the LED one, the little black one here, that's the LED driving relay. Uh, this one's the killer relay for the audio. 
it's just a in the grid current and then drives the, this one <clears throat> do the big stuff and the one in the middle we'll as i say we'll look at that and part of that is a 250 volt relay here so we'll look at the control of it in a second and there's a sort of a better view of the whole thing you've got the uh, aux switch here for the mains the delay neon the main ht enable and then uh, the other bits of switching that we looked at the thing about the the configuration is that if the operator wishes they can they can connect the mains to the back panel here on the IEC flying lead. Put all all these switches to on. The two main switches can be left switched on, and then if a time switch comes on and inputs mains into here, um, the aux will come on and it will then run itself up automatically onto power, and will stay on the air as long as mains is applied. So then they can set the time switch for it to automatically turn off at another point. So that's the way it's done. There's three electrolytics here bolted onto the onto the back panel. The chassis is from uh, a guy in Birmingham named Solihull, G8. G8, where's his name? I did write it down. Anyway, Jeff. Yeah, G8. Yes, yes, it's gone. <laughs> anyway, Jeff does the chassis, king of the chassis, G8 HDI. Um, he made them especially for me and just gave him the sizes. Uh, so that's the that's the chassis work there. Right, a bit of circuitry. This is the uh, actual HT circuit, and the main HT transformer is here. It's shown tapped here, and this is a 200 volt, sorry, a 200 watt tap, and that's the 250 watt tap. I give them, I give the operators who have these a choice. They can pick which one they want. Do you want to run full power or not? So we've got a fuse in the in the line here, 800 milliamps, and then into the bridge rectifier. Ignore this little patch of, uh, of smoothing for a second, but there's the HT line running out to plus, and you've got a, a smoothing capacitor on the end, 220, 220, 220, so 66 UF on the end with the bleeder resistors across. There's a little bit of switching here that um, is and a little bit of circuitry that is slightly unusual, but you might wish to know why it's like this. The negative of the rectifier does not go straight down to chassis. It actually starts on this choke here, the smoothing choke. So the smoothing choke is in a negative rail on this transmitter. And the right-hand side here of the choke is to earth, which is then the, actually the proper negative bit. The reason for this is twofold. Um, well, one fold really. The most important thing is these, this has got this component will have, if it's up here, uh, nearly 800 volts on it to earth. If you just lift it up from the negative, the most it ever gets is about 16 volts negative. So we're not stressing the insulation in this at all. So that makes a, 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 it's a sensible thing to do if you get want an HV supply, but I mean, you don't want to stress that component. Make put the smoothing in the negative, it works just as well. Um, but there are two connections to it. There's a connection, an extra connection on the earth, which runs down to this relay compact here. And an, another, the, the, the common of the relay runs up to the bottom of this, of this bank of capacitors. And by switching, you can alter whether it's a capacity input filter or a choke input filter. When the transmitter comes on the air in low power, these capacitors are connected to this side of the choke. So there's 470, 470, 470, about 100 and something microfarads or whatever uh, on this side, in addition to the 66. But when you want to go to full power, you can relay switch, click, and then it makes it capacitor input and you get the full 800 volts out. That's 800 volts on here. It's about 750 in the reduced one. So you've got the option there of, uh, of the switching. If you, oh, yes, that's, that's in, the main, in the main HD condition. If, if you want to run it on reduced power and it's always in choke input then, because you don't have to make, you can disable that relay function as I'll show you in a second. You can always keep it on reduced. So these capacitors are then in, always in, in, in parallel with these. So it's always choke input. It's about 100 watts output then, which is useful for tune-ups or fault conditions on antennas, etc. The control supply 
is a 12 volt DC, just nicked from the filaments and uh, rectified and smoothed, and then into a 7, 8, 12 um, chip. And um, when you ask for main HT, you get 240 volts on this transformer, but also across that connection is a, that little relay I showed you, the 240 volt relay, that's got a, a contact there that says, ah, he's, the HT has been asked, I'm closed. What happens now? And what happens now is that it can run along here to this contact here. And there's a 0 0.7, 0 0.75 second timer. So if you put it onto full, this timer runs and after um, three quarters of a second, it shuts and then that change that over. So when you when you come up on the air from cold, you always come up on reduced power, reduced uh, HT voltage, and then it will switch to full. And there's the indications on the front there with the uh, with the LED. So that's how the um, HT system works. Just a few things there that if you're building a linear or something, it just give you a few thoughts on how to uh, get a low voltage startup, a nice step start as we call it on the 250 kilowatts. They used to start at 100 kilowatts and would switch up to 250 when uh, when you've gone through about 0.75 of a second, which is, is of course where I got the idea from. Um, here's the synthesizer. It's a, uh, as I said, the design from Dave GW4GTE out at um, 500 millivolts into the waffle driver board then out into the PL84, just with a tuned circuit in the anode. Nothing, uh, nothing revolutionary about this. In class C, but with a bit of protective bias in case it all stopped. I did cheat on this uh, rig and went, because I got um, the synthesizer wanting 12 volts as well. I actually used the switch mode power supply and thinking about it, that's probably the most unreliable thing that's in that chassis. Um, <laughs> but there we are. So that's the driver stage and the, um, and the, um, the synthesizer and the also the actual driver to the three tubes in the output. Here's the uh, the three tubes in the output shown as one, but there's three of them in parallel. You've got a pi network on the output, a little capacity divider here, so you can drive a scope. Uh, a thousand puff load, ten turns on that coil. This is a this is the forty nine meter band settings. Uh, the tune and the tune side is here with the white space and just a bit of extra padding to get that center scale. So you've got a bit of leeway either side. Modulation comes in the top through the secondary of the mod transformer. Here's your choke from the states, antiparasitic components that you've seen, and uh, some metering. So there's a meter shunt here and reads the cathode current 0, 500 milliamps. Um, here's the screen droppers and goes to the anode of this PL84 and the screen connectors as a triode. Earthed on there, don't need many components around this tube. You can earth that and just stick that onto the screen. And the negative that holds this valve off when everything is okay is generated here on the grids. You've got the RF choke there. And then above earth, you've got 4K7, the 48 volt relay, which is about 2.5K ohms and a 1.1K across a grid current meter. That's in case the meter fails, it will still work. Um, as I say, if grid currents being generated by the input into this stage, it um, holds, it lets the modulation go as well. Here's the switching for that, but um, it also keeps the clamp tubes switched off. There's a big negative voltage, a large negative voltage on the on the screen, on the cap, on the control grid there. So no current flows. So these this screen volts here are allowed to be the correct value. When, when the clamp tube switches on, those screen volts that would normally be about 250 will drop down to about 40 volts and protect that tube there. Um, 12 volt DC control. This relay here is the one that drives the um, the modulation and there's a, there's the contacts for it 12 volt dc relay and that when that closes that, that operates shuts that one and lets your mod come in here i have had instances of disco amps and not being not really liking uh to drive into a a, a large inductance like a, a transformer they're okay into loudspeakers particularly these class d and class e things um so what we've had to do is 
put a bit of protection in with the option that the people who are using it can can remove it so i put an extra one ohm in and an extra half an ohm in and also this little zobel network of three r3 and two capacitors back to back just to give it this transformer sorry just to give the the um disco amp a semblance of a not a totally inductive load and that has saved a few but there is a firm in warrington um called mcgregor amplification i've spoken to mr mcgregor and he says tell them to use one of my 250 watt amps and you can throw away all that you don't need any of the protection at all just put your transformer and its relay straight onto my amp output it will be fine and it is so we've still got the technology in this country to sort stuff and that's the hd switching again sorry we've done that one and right so I told you earlier that um, the authorities in, in Europe have been much more proactive than Ofcom in this country from people who wish to use the broadcast bands for broadcasting uh, rather than <clears throat> now, that they, now that the big boys have left shortwave to a degree, there are spare times and spare frequencies. And these are the allocations. This is a a publication that's put out by the owner of the Danish station, who's here, HCJ, no, here he is, World Music Radio, Denmark, DNK. Um, he puts this up once every month, and you can see who's got tickets and what hours that they want to be on the air. So you'll see there's some activity in the 75 meter band, uh, shortwave gold, that's one of those 250 watt transmitters from Vinzen. That's one of my German friends. So they're on 3975. And World Music Radio on 5930. That's another one. And there's a one of it further down on six. It's on the next slide. That's one of mine. A lot of these services, if you see the radio channel 292s here, 3955, another one here, 6070. Um, they broke a time for the other broadcasters to put their programs on so it's a bit like um uh, encompass you can go to encompass and say can can we book 20 hours a week on so many days or whatever and and you pay for what you have so radio channel 292 broker other people as do shortwave gold uh but h but um the danish lad world music radio puts his own programming out on on, on the stuff so you've got Danish uh, German stations. This is an interesting channel. 3955 is still used by Encompass from Wufferton at 250 kilowatts. And you'll see there's a gap there between 2000 and 2200 when uh, Wufferton's on the air. You don't really want to compete with that. 292 was um, a former um, West German, I think, hole in the ground job uh, radio station that was then sold off when they had no need, when the military, et cetera, had no need for it anymore. And these lads bought it. Then they got like two kilowatt, two and a half kilowatt transmitters in there. At, uh, at, uh, that's, their, that's their system. As you see, so you've got uh, the Germans are on. Norway have given a ticket out. <coughs> that's brokered from another, another German one, Vaynermor, HCJB, Christian Broadcasting. Uh, World Moose Radio in Holland, then there's a, the Dutch enthusiasts have paid a few euros to come on the air. And uh, and the same, there's extra people in Denmark doing it besides World Music Radio. Radio, well, the Radio 208 is a, is a World Music Radio production. Radio Oz Viola is another operator in Denmark. The Finnish have got one here, and the Germans and the Dutch, etc. And then we can go to the next slide. So we're up to 6115. So we've done the 75 and the 49 meter band. We'll continue with the 49 meter band here. So 6125, <coughs> Radio Europe, Dutch, uh, Belgian station, but actually transmitting from the Netherlands. Europa 24, that's one of these transmitters, as is shortwave gold. That was the first one that we supplied to uh, the guy in Datel, 0800 to 1605 a daily. Uh, Scandinavian weekend radio, Finnish, Dutch, Dutch, Dutch. We saw it going in break now, 41 meter band, 31 meter band. And in the 25 meter band, the lads from Finland, another Danish output here. Oh, these 
surprisingly he's put German but it's actually him in in Denmark so I think that's a typo because Randers is in Denmark uh, and then again now he's got this extra service going out which is an interesting one to watch for 25 800 might be worth keeping a check on that from Mr Stud Stig Hart Big Nielsen his name so um, worth keeping an eye on 25 800 and seeing it's propagating so a lot of these stations have tried um, the Greek senders that they buy from the internet. They're full of MOSFETs and uh, many of them seem to suffer the your normal MOSFET operating state of the world's fastest fuses and also have asymmetric AM. In other words, the positive peaks don't match the negative peaks. You can never can, it was always hard to get the positive peak out to be to be linear. You can get the negatives right, but it's hard to get the positives out without some very clever circuitry for semiconductors. I have found, but uh, good luck to other people who have done it. So there we are. If you want to put me back in the room, Tom, tell me what to do, and I'll answer any questions if that's okay. Yeah, sure thing, Dave. If you just uh, unshare your screen, uh, we'll be able to Where's see you again. Click? Uh, if you, I think if oh, you go, stop share. That's the one. Yeah, okay. There we are. Well, Good was stuff. that all right, chaps and ladies, if we've got any? Yeah. Very good. No uh, audio. Can you. You go ahead, um, Simon. Sorry, yeah, I was just um, waiting for my sound to come up. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, um, we'd like to give you at this point, before we switch to questions, from uh, both the hall here and the virtual world, um, a big round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, beautiful uh, construction on that uh, transmitter there. I was really enjoying looking at that. And uh, thank you for the photos of that as well. It's very interesting. So um, I'm going to hand over to questions now. If we start with the floor in here, has anyone got uh, any questions on the floor? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, let's see if we've got any in the virtual world. Oh, right, Jerry O. Jobs, I'm going there. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Jim. Uh, David, thank you very much for an interesting talk. Uh, I'm Jim Carter, G0LHZ. Um, I'm probably going to regret asking these questions. <laughs> um, Surely these things have to be type approved to be used by third parties. How do you, what do you do about type approval? What do you do about safety and CE marking and such things? Well, that, that, that's, an, that's a very interesting, uh, the CE marking is of particular interest to me because when I was at work and we, we took, remember I've been there for a while and the transmitters we were using at Wolferton were Marconi, so they were last, the new, the ones, the latest ones they installed there were 1978, 9, 81 that sort of time before the CE mark. And then in 2006, we had an upgrade because we were privatized and they wanted to spend some money. So that Vosper Thornycroft went to, we were looking around for some transmitters and they went to RIS in the former Yugoslavia, which is uh, Zagreb, so it's um, Croatia. They went to the Croatian manufacturer RIS. And Riz duly said, well, actually, um, we've got a 500 kilowatt transmitter. And uh, Wolferton said, but our antennas will only do 300 watt. And they said, 300 kilowatts. And they said, well, don't worry, we can turn it down for you. But it's one we made as the prototype. The, the second one we made, we've sold to the Germans under their name of Telefunk. And it's been badge engineered, but it's really ours. And they've put it in at um, Vitactyl. But they've taken it out of the fact to have moved it to now and but he said it is there we've got the prototype so if you like it you can have it cheaply and of course to a privatized company uh, that was too much of an offer and so they accepted it and i looked all over that transmitter in every single nook and cranny and bit of the instruction book and there is not a ce to be seen and that intrigued me and I actually asked the Riz lads, I says, why don't, don't you do CE? He says, well, he said, we can't really complete it. I says, why is that? He says, because it actually is supposed to emit and we can't make it that we can get, we can't get rid of the 500 kilowatts or 250 kilowatts worth 
so that we can measure anything that might be dodgy. So I thought, well, that's strange. But that was the way. So we went to buy three more then for Wolfington <coughs> of these. Now they have got a new design and they made a 250 kilowatt design. And we put that in at Wolfington. We put one in at Skelton and um, and four in at Ascension Island. And none of them's got CE. And I was always still intrigued the day I left why that wasn't uh, an event. But the other one was with regard to my own thing on this, I've I've spoken to Ofcom about this. Well, a person in Ofcom. And I had the distinct impression that it was, I don't really want you to ask me this. And so I didn't ask him that because it seems to me that if you, if you have the thing, it's the same on the medium wave one, there's a rack into which it can be placed. The, the Ofcom regulations on medium wave are particular that it has to be in a, in a, a building where people can't get at it. And so you supply it in the rack and you, you issue the instruction that high voltage is present on this and uh, it's up to them to, to make it safe, which is what they normally do. I've noticed all these installations that have been done on the medium wave have been in, always in small enclosures. And there's the only thing, the only problem I had <coughs> was a station in Scotland brought me it back and said, could you remove the dead rat from it, please? <laughs> which had got itself impaled across the uh, RF choke on the output stage. But it was fortunate because I got a spare one here that he took up with him and, and I sold it to them uh, as, a, as a spare. So they've now got, which is what they should have had to start with, a main and a reserve. Um, <laughs> uh, and I did get the rat out, but uh, it wasn't a terrible... I've, I've had more pleasant jobs. So to answer your question, which is long-winded, I'm sorry, CE is tricky, and you asked me something else, and I've forgotten what that was. Oh, you well, asked me about the safety of it. Yes, well, it looks like it's DIY, approval. really. Well, uh, no, I asked about, also asked about type approval, which is actually also part of CE. Yes, I'm absolutely right. staggered. As far as having spent many, many hours professionally doing this sort of thing, I cannot believe that the equipment is outside CE or type approval. It's clearly within... So I just, you, you I'm just to, staggered at what you just played that. I suppose <laughs> on the export from the UK, not sure. Even different now under Brexit. Oh, it's much more complicated. We, where we are, it's probably difficult. All I can say is that the uh, B nets have inspected these things, certainly in the German domain, and provided the main criteria is that the harmonics are within whatever dBs they specify, often. Uh, 60 <clears throat> and the modulation must not exceed 4.5 kilohertz the 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 top three which is fine because that's up to the labs who control the audio that goes in on their uh, disco amp that is the criteria on that one and the the off the the b nets of people come along stick the measuring equipment on and tick a box so your guess is as good as mine jim I, i'm uh, <laughs> i'm in your hands I'm completely flabbergasted, I, particularly with the Germans who are very, very tough. Uh, you know, I've, I've, I've been through this myself with many products, very tough on products. I, I cannot believe that you don't have to do anything on the safety side, let alone the, the transmission side. I, I'm at, well, I'm, I shall back down now. I'm flabbergasted. Yeah, well I done. Was. I mean, I just, I just, I, I was asked to do something. I did something and it's as simple as that, you know, but. Uh, well, well whether done. It, whether it's for broadcasting, <laughs> Certain bits of it, whether it's particularly HF, whether it's in the too difficult to do pile, I don't know. It's it's very similar to the test that they've asked us to do on on the Ofcom at the moment for the amateur radio with regard to the EMF. Um, having run the broadcast station on Clee Hill that we've got up there, which is two hundred and fifty watts vertical, two hundred and fifty watt horizontal on on band two, I've not been asked to fill in an EMF for that site. And I thought that would be top of the tree, but I'm, I've done the calculation, but I've not been asked to do the calculation. I'm not been told that I've got to have it to hand to demonstrate to them. It's all I know is that if you climb the mast and keep it keep away from the little antenna on the top more than four meters, you're okay. But it's most odd, and that's all I can say. 
I'm but staggered. I'm not arguing. No, no, no. Well done. <laughs> I, I'm absolutely staggered. <laughs> well, go ahead, Ben. Thank you. Uh, oh. Um, I don't need my headset. Um, J D Dave, just very brief, roughly, how much does that lovely transmitter you showed us cost a purchaser who wants one? If you'd like to buy one, I can supply one for 1,750 quid, but no, sorry, 1,500 quid, but please buy your own modulator. It's a snip. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Any further questions? But can I? Yeah, sorry. I'll just. Um, how long? does it take um, to build that, that particular one that you showed us in the photograph? Oh, it takes normally, just being sensible with it, it's, it takes about four weeks, really. It depends if somebody rings me up and says, it's blown up, can you do something quickly? Uh, which I might be able to do it in two weeks then. But I normally keep a sort of partially built one in the shack, I've got one down there at the moment that's on HF, but it would quickly convert to MF if needed because I just altered the coils on it to uh, be different. There are a couple of changes on the MF one. Ofcom uh, like something to photograph. <laughs> they like to photograph an output meter. Um, so what you do is you provide an output meter and you can come back, calibrate it in Mickey Mouse units or whatever you wish. And what I normally do is make it read 0 0.7 of a milliamp because it's 0 to 1 milliamp. And so I stick a, a, a 1 milliamp meter on the front. That, that, the other one then becomes a grid and cathode current meter with a switch on the front. So you pick which one you want with a switch on the front. So it's still the same layout. But as I say, Ofcom want this meter to photograph. So what we do is we use, just put a, a sensing line in and the tip for this is use Pope's H100 cable or Westlake 103, it's the same. And if you look at that RF coax, it's cellular like old 75 ohm TV coax was. It's 50 ohm, of course. And if you get a piece about a foot long uh, or 10 inches long, you can thread a sampling wire up the cell from one end to the other. You don't need the backward power diode bit, you just want the forward power bit and rectify it via a OA70, uh, OA91 and a pot and use the pot screwdriver just of course only uh, on the back panel so that when it gives 250 watts it reads 0 0.7 on the scale and that's the regular pit power. Ofcom come along, take a photograph of that and then when they, if they ever they call again, they, uh, they just want to make sure that the operator hasn't turned up the power to more than 0.7 on that meter. But you know and I know you can tweak it in the back and make it read what you like. But as I say, again, Jim, you have to just go through the motions and uh, play the game, really. And um, there you are. <laughs> but they do like an output power meter. That's a big deal for Ofcom. <laughs> I hope Thank there's nobody from Ofcom here. <laughs> Uh, Dave, thanks very much for a good talk. I'm uh, up in Bromsgrove tomorrow morning. Oh, yes. Um, I was down in the hall earlier and I've had to come home and because uh, I've got an early start tomorrow morning. And um, is there anything uh, worth seeing there now at the uh, at uh, Droitwich, at the site nearby? Yeah, it's, 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 the same, it's, it's almost the same as it ever was, Marlott. There's... Um... There's the, uh, the big LFT, of course, with the four wire box drop of Tony Preedy, G8L, L, whatever he is. I mean, I've got him here. No, he's not on that one. That's an EBU document. But yeah, Tony Preedy's uh, big boy's 500 kilowatt T. Uh, as the two masts to the north of the site that are directional on medium wave 1053 and 1215. And the southerly mast that supports half of the T is the 693 vertical on 700 foot's worth and jacked up insulators at the bottom. So it's still the same as it ever was, but don't forget the long wave's not on full power. Yeah. It's on AMC, Mickey Mouse mod. Are they uh, mm. user friendly to anybody knocking on the door and say, can I have a look around? 
you could try it. And if Ian's there, Ian Ashford, write his call sign down. G H P W E, King of the Duplexes for the Amateur Radio. Uh, G-A-C, what, C-W-E? Uh, Ian Ashford is his name. Yeah. G-A-P-W-E, Political Warfare Executive. <laughs> yep. If he's on, or Paul, G-A-Y-L-B, I think. Paul. If yep. he's there, you'll be okay. But they're Paul, training kids yeah. at the moment. Paul's surname was? I'm trying to retrieve it. Come on, give us his call sign. <laughs> G8YLB, I think, but it's certainly G8Y. There's not many of them around. Okay. Paul Clampin, C L A M P I N. Well done. Well, I'll, uh, I'll I'll try and film when I finish tomorrow, which I hopefully will be about lunchtime. I might go and see if I can knock on the door. Yeah, okay. Well, if you, and if you're, you want to put a call out on the MS radio and you can program your machine, you can call us through GB3 Victor Mike on yeah. 145 6125. Okay. And that's CTCSS of 103.5. GB3, Victor, Mike. Thanks very much indeed. Pleasure. That program before I, uh, well, on the way up tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, that'd be good. <laughs> I've, I've said I passed them quite a few times and I've looked at them and I've also looked up the history um, on the internet about them or whatever, the old generators and everything else and the kit going in. And um, it was quite amazing. I'm thinking, well, can I get in there? And I drove past and I saw the gates were open. I couldn't see sort of security sat on the gates. And I thought, well, I better go and do some work. And I thought, no, nah, I won't go in. But yeah, I'll, I'll give it a try and see if we can get a visit in there and uh, see what they have to say. Have a quick look. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that'll be all right. Yeah, I, say, yeah, I said days. Mickey Mouse mod. That's because it's on AMC. That's amplitude modulation companding for, for the uninitiated, which is when you mod, uh, the carrier level drops as well, so it saves electricity. The, you think about a, a 250 kilowatt transmitter, the peak envelope power is a million watts at 100% modulation. So if you put 6 dB of AMC on, the peak envelope power on plain carrier is 250 kilowatt, which is what yeah. it is on plain carrier on, on as regular AM. But as soon as you modulate that 250 kilowatts, the carrier level drops in proportion to the mod index. So at 100% mod, the carrier is 62.5 kilowatts and the PEP is 250 kilowatts. In other words, with any sort of modulation on an AMC transmitter, if it's 6 dB of AMC, the PEP is always the same. Another quick question for you: Did you uh, did you ever go to a place called Barford St John? No, that's an RAF base, presumably. It was an RAF base which was taken over by the Americans, and uh, we put an auto transformer smoothing system in there. And um, I was looking at their racks and everything, and there was a was it a one kilowatt load bank, on what have you in this uh, in amongst all these racks? And when I sort of made a question. The uh, salesman that was with me was uh, basically, let me say, very frightened that I might ask a question mm -hmm. that I could not answer. But, <laughs> or that, or they wouldn't like me to answer. Because I said, oh, yeah, do they do more for me or do they do CW? Because the stuff up there, all the, all the antennas have now gone, but they've now got uh, a dome up there and very much pointed uh, 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 antennas and what have you. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, I was on a, exactly the same. I was on the course at Wolverton once with some folks who come across from VT, who were from Cyprus. And we had some people from the broadcast side at Cyprus, but we also had some people from the mill side. And they were saying, well, you're very welcome to come to our bit, but don't go through that door. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only RF when you've done and said all, really, you know. And it was the same when we, when we were VT. I uh, know when we were Merlin and we got the contract for um, the mill services, um, right. they said to us, you, you're not to talk about this station, that we've got to go to site S or site A, and uh, you're not to say anything about it. So we didn't. But if you just look what's at Skelton and at Anthorn, it might be more obvious. <laughs> well, they gave me the passcode for the, the gate to get in, which was, I think, three nines. And what oh, I good. Did. Um, I, I drove up and the uh, uh, 
it was a building site basically and the chap at the main gate so i said i looked up and all these antennas all these sort of uh, wire antennas up there and i'm looking at this i said oh they're interesting he saw the aerial on the car and he said oh well, there, there's a map he said of the whole site with all the antennas on it and whatever you're going to go to the middle of it he said and you go three nines on the on the gate and you can go in and i thought this is high security american place and whatever but yeah hey what well I had about three visits there looking at a couple of pro problems on these uh, data converters or data uh, waves, what they call data waves for smoothing out the power supply. Um, and uh, they, they were like a, a UPS, but no batteries to support them. And, um, you know, they had these in there. And yeah, some days they were completely open and quite chatty. Some days they were very tight lipped, you know. Yeah, we had the same thing on security at Stroud. We did it in, in the 80s, the BBC got us. HF people to go and do television as well. So we're into the world of UHF and stuff. So I said, I couldn't get away from it. I escaped in the 70s, but it got me again in the 80s. And we were, went to Stroud TV station and it's this, um, a, a multi-user place. And there's a BT cabin there. And there was some reason we had to go into it. So you ring up BT and they say, can we, can we go in your, yeah, he says, mate, it's one, two, three, four on the door. <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. Can I make a comment about your variable modulation process? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Um, I got involved in this and we found that it didn't quite work at first because all the short waivers had been fed via audio twisted pairs. And then they changed it all to digital because that was cheaper, believe it or not. Um, and it didn't work. And the reason it didn't work was that a twisted pair produces a huge amount of differential phase delay in the audio. When you went digital, the audio that came out the far end was the exact reproduction of the waveform that was fed in. So there were much higher peaks in the audio than there were once it was phase um, differentiated. So it all had to be well processed to, to level all that out, presumably. Yeah, that we had to thing. make we had to make the artificial phase dis, um make it look like it used to be. Yeah. Because it was it was too good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it saves electric, so that's all right then. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to hand over to Alan now, he's been patiently waiting. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Yeah, it's only a quick question, actually, but just on, on that last comment there, I'd hate to try and put that into the foundation course, teaching that. <laughs> what, Mickey Mouse modulation? Yeah. <laughs> well, you can teach the German one, which was uh, the DCC one on, on the off transmitter. That's where you it rests at about 200 kilowatts. And when you modulated, it went up to 500 on the carrier plus wow. all the modulation. So that's way, it's all over the place on, on that one. The, the AMC was much kinder to the kit. <coughs> I'm pleased to say. Interesting stuff. But the question I was going to ask, well, it's a trivial question, really. You mentioned the GU5 bases are, are basically not available anymore on military ones. Um, are the GU5 tubes still plenty, plentiful available? That is oh. before today, anyway. <laughs> oh, what, the GU50s? G50 yeah, there's so. lots of those. <laughs> Sadly, and you're dead right with that comment, most of them come out of the Ukraine. <laughs> which is, <laughs> um, but there are some, I think there's people on eBay who sell them from Latvia and Lithuania, so best getting quick. But you can't get any more watts really in, in that sort of size. If, you, right. if you're old enough to know what a TT21 or a TT22 was, that's a top capped. Uh -huh. KT-88. Oh, right, yeah, remember those. They yeah. were 45 watt anode dissipation, uh -huh. and these GU-50s are 40 watts. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they're, a, they're an interesting uh -huh. interesting tube. And don't don't press the bases, don't press the tube into your hand, mm -hmm. okay. because the pins are V-sharp with points. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> right, okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks for that. Okay, any further questions, either from yeah. the room or online? Just a quick one from the room. Um, cooling on the on that device, John G four RDC. Uh, what's the? Did you have to do any? What's the cooling arrangement? Did you did you model it in any way or? 
No, I've, I've just sat it there and kept the tubes away from, as far away from the ironwork as we can. And I always advise uh, people who have it to make sure that there's cold air in the bottom of the enclosure in which they place it and an exit at the top so it can convect. Others who've used it have said, what we've done is we've borrowed the fan out the out of the secretary's office and uh, and stuck the, the 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 cooling fan so it's just directed on onto the tubes at the back in the summer, which is all it seems to want really. Um, you're not getting rid of a great deal. Um, it's just that if the room's particularly small, it will obviously concentrate the heat. You do want some. You want a hole in the bottom and a hole at the top, but not big enough to let the rat in. <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, what's what's the next project then in transmitters? Um, so, you're going for uh, something bigger, perhaps? Well, I've done the FM now. I did that this year with um, that was a cheap one though. Um, in that it was an FM rebroadcaster, so you just pick up the parent station, and in the kit it knocks it down to multiplex and puts it out on a new frequency. That's uh, a one watt exciter with the receiver incorporated. And you get one watt out of the back, which you then feed to a, it's, it's just one MOSFET apparently in the amplifier and out pops up to 300 watts. Quite an amazing device, really. Switch mode power supply, weighs next to nothing yeah. and um, looks after itself as regards SWR. It's got all the filtering inside. That's another thing Ofcom like to always look at. They do like to look at the filtering and see what the spectrum looks like, as particularly if you're on band two, because they don't want you with the aircraft next door. Um, that's a no-no is the aircraft next door they're big on that um so i've done that one i'm not thinking about dab been busy on the repeaters we've moved the one from wufferton transmitting station onto clee hill as i was telling Marnik about there uh we've done that so we've got a better site now but i didn't know until ian ashford told me that if you co-site 144 particularly megahertz repeaters with DAB transmitters, there can be quite a, a sort of filth envelope coming out of the DAB. Uh, it's not measurable in Ofcom land, but in repeater land, when you're working down at 100 and minus 110 dB, uh, apparently the switching of the carriers on the DAB can give you sort of like a, a noise fog around the, around, the, um, around the installation. He was going to put a repeater in for lockdown at a certain site in Birmingham, but it's got DAB on it. So he wasn't able to do it. There was just too much local hash noise with the output carriers all banging on and off uh, with the, you know, the CQAM to, to, to make it um, not, not possible to do it. So that's one to remember, mix amateur radio and DAB. But, uh, yes. Has anybody else noticed that on the BBC now, it's, uh, it's on 90, it's on 88 to 91 FM and on the BBC Sounds app, full stop. They don't mention the DAB anymore. So whether it's living up to its pseudonym that we gave it years ago of dead and buried, I don't know. Yep, thanks, Dave. I think there was a question in the chat. Did you spot that, Tom? Oh, yeah, George. Uh, do you want to pipe up, George? Do it audio? audio? OK, uh, so... George said, please, can you say again the details of the synth? Oh, the synth, yeah. Uh, the kit, the inst you want to go to s9plus.com, www.s9plus, nine, it's the figure nine, Sierra9, plus.com, s9plus.com. That's um, Dave's site, GW4GTE. Look for synthesizer, and if you want one, then you correspond with GW8LJJ, whose name temporarily escapes me, uh, the kit supplier in your Cardiff, and he'll he'll sort you out, no problem. <laughs> I've been asked to write, I wrote a piece for Practical Wireless about how to make that kit, uh, but he hasn't published it yet. Uh, it's been about 11 months so you might find that in the next issue or three if ever there might be something about it uh, there's a certain way to build it and if you get it wrong it can be more tricky it's only because you don't read the instructions properly it is well documented but you have to have a go at it wrong to everybody has to do it the wrong way around the first or second time 
don't they? <laughs> but it works very well, reliable, and uh, half a volt out. And okay to at least 30 megahertz from DC almost. So a good piece of kit. Great stuff. So any further questions before we uh, wrap up? And George says thank you. Pleasure. Okay, Simon, I think I'll hand it back to you. All right. Well, um, again, thank you very much. And uh, it's been very enjoyable and very informative. So, uh, yeah, and uh, I'm sure uh, we'll be uh, wanting to invite you back again uh, shortly <laughs> sometime to speak again, because it's been great. So. Um, Another round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Dave. And um, normally we would be able to offer you some jammy dodgers and tea and coffee, but that's the downside of virtual, I'm afraid. So you just have to uh, have the thought of that. Um, but um, so, yeah, we'll, um, we'll hand over the um, virtual side now. So um, um, I don't know. You, you'll probably want to uh, to leave us, uh, Dave, but if yeah, you want I'll take, to... I'll, I'll take my leave, Jack. So, OK, just one point about a jammy dodgers. There was a story um, from a guy who worked for Nats that they had to actually go to the jammy dodger factory and sort out the 27 megahertz um, you know, the RF heater for that production line because it was interfering with air tragic control. So... Uh, <laughs> We actually wrote an article, which was Speedbird Calling Jammy Dodger, or was it the other way around? <laughs> Cheers to you all. Excellent. Thank you very much. Good Hello. evening. Yeah. Yeah, just, uh, just a quick one. Dave writes for VMAR's Signal magazine. He's a brilliant writer. So this is a plug for the Vintage and Military Amateur Radio Society, and it's well worth getting the magazine for that, because uh, he does it. Yeah. Does, Don't does forget that. Go, for am I, are you still receiving me? Yeah. Are you still, yeah. If you go on BBC N, BBC dot Eng info, BBC dot Eng info. That's Martin Ellen's site about BBC transmission from the start to 1997. I write the articles I put in Signal are on there as well, so you can have Brilliant. a trawl through that one. Yeah. There's about 49 articles on there. We've just done a 16 pager on 80 years of BBC and VOA audio processing. And that's in the next one, as well as the usual tricks of the trade. So there's a bumper one coming up, if you can stand to read it. It's brilliant, Dave. Thank you. <laughs>